This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Folks, let's have some fun. Next hour or so, we're going to just be talking about gardening. I'm horticulture Felder Rushing, and again, I was just in the other studio with, with Java, kicking around some things, showing some pictures of stuff in my garden, because uh, as some of you know, this is my first summer in several years to be here. I usually go over to England, and uh, been here all summer. Here it is, the end of August, and I actually grew some some vegetable. I planted some stuff that you, usually I don't plant stuff in the spring, because I got shrubs and perennials and reseeding things that that make it without needing a whole bunch of care. Well, this summer, uh, I actually planted some stuff that needed me, some things that needed me to to prop them up or to water them or to weed them or to, you know, to pick them and stuff like that, including some annuals that I haven't gr- grown before because some annuals need a little, little help, but I also planted some vegetables. Um, been a long time since I planted anything that, that, that just couldn't take it. I've always planted okra and gourds and, you know, stuff like that because sweet potatoes because they, cause they grow really easy. They're pretty. They look good in the landscape, and they'll make it through the summer and have something I can do with it in the fall. But this year I planted corn and beans and squash and peppers and tomatoes and uh, real sweet potatoes, not just the ornamental kinds. And they have really done Pretty good, pretty good. I'm not a great gardener, you know. There's, we all know, country folks who just throw stuff in just plain old dirt and it grows. Well, and I overthink things, I overdo things, and and uh, so I get some, I get some hope. I grow hope, <laughs> and every now and then I get a squash. Um, this week, though, a couple of interesting things happened. One is that my sweet potatoes started blooming, and it's really obvious uh, that they're in the morning glory family. The flowers look more like. Petunias. They're white with uh, uh, lavender, kind of pinkish, almost red throats. And they're about the size of big petunias. Not not related to petunias. They're related to, to uh, morning glories. But it's a beautiful flower. And I had some burgundy uh, uh, must, uh, excuse me, burgundy basil growing nearby, which also has flowers that are white streaked with pink. So a real nice little, little lanyap out there. And plus, I got basil and sweet potatoes, too. Got a couple of other things I want to talk about. I brought in my heirloom plant of the week. I'd like to talk about. I brought my vegetable of the week, my native wildflower of the week, and also the kids' garden plant, probably the best kids' garden plant ever. We're going to be talking about all that and more, but it is a live program. If there's some things you want to talk about, it's your party, too. Uh, I'll stop yakking and listen to you. We're going to start out going up to Memphis, Tennessee. Good morning, Roy. How are you this morning? Good morning, Felder. Got got two questions for you. Okay. Uh, one is I've decided to tear up my kiwi plants because they just haven't done anything for yep, years. Yeah, yeah. Did you ask me about it when you got started? Uh, no, I asked you about it earlier this year to see what's wrong with them, and you told me forget it. Yeah. Well, you know, have fu- have fun, have fun, but forget kiwi. <laughs> yeah. Now, now here's my question. Um, I've I've got a fig tree that's just fantastic. And I'm looking at putting a couple more different uh, fruit trees Mm -hmm. that are just as easy to grow and prolific as figs. Yeah. And looking around, mulberry uh, trees and plums have been recommended. What what do you think? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I I like plums in general. Uh, Plums and peaches need to be sprayed. In general, we have insects that attack the fruit, insects that attack the trees, both of which are hard to impossible to control once they get in the fruit or in the tree. We have diseases that affect the fruit because of humidity. So peaches and plums, typically, I'm going to say you need to spray them. You know, and if you don't mind spraying, go for it. Uh, but if you don't want to spray three or four, five, eight times from spring till harvest, uh, I'd stay away from them. Uh, they're they're pretty. Don't get me wrong; they bloom well. And if you could get your hands on them, there's an old for- variety of peach called Indian Cling. Indian Cling. It's small. They're hard. They that you know that the uh, the stone in it, the the pit sticks to it. There's a reason called cling, uh, cling stone. But it's beautiful when it flowers. It's got burgundy leaves, and it always makes peaches without any bugs on it. They're just not good to eat. 
you know, you can stick clothes in them and pickle them and, you know, serve them up at Thanksgiving. All the kids will remember you forever. But uh, that's about, you know, that. And then there is a native plum that does pretty well. It's called the Chickasaw plum. It's one you see growing in thickets along the roadside. It, uh, a small plant, white flowers, early, late in the winter. And uh, and it has pretty good fruit and doesn't have, seem to have the problems. But uh, I would stick with, you know, figs are good. There are some good pears. There's a pear that's called... Um, Orient, not oriental pear, but the one called Orient, pollinates itself and makes pretty good fruit without a lot of diseases. Uh, and there's blueberries, which, you know, you plant three or four blueberry bushes either in one big hole, like one big happy family, or a row of them. They're beautiful when they bloom. They have incredible fall colors, and they make a good fruit in the middle of the summer. But blueberries are a good choice. Yeah, I've got blueberries. What about mulberries? Mulberries are, are tree. I mean, they're great, but, you know, if you're going to grow a mulberry tree, treat it like a, you know how people cr- prune the crepe myrtles back into big knobby things? Yuck, yeah. You need to do the blueberry, uh, the mulberry that way so you, like this, that. yeah, sprouts out and you can actually reach the fruit because otherwise it's a, it's a tree. They're kind of hard to reach. They stain real bad. The birds get on them, but boy, oh boy, oh boy, there are raspberries on a tree is what they are. And hey, let me throw out one other one. This is one that I was grew up with uh, just south of Memphis in the Delta. Uh, that my great grandmother planted before my dad was born, and Katrina blew it down. It was a, a Japanese persimmon. They're pretty. There's one called Fuyu or Fuyugaki. That's a beautiful ornamental tree. It has nice, uh, not not quite baseball size fruits in uh, the in the fall. They're pretty, and uh, they're not astringent. You can eat them right off the plant with a spoon. But they're pretty plants, and uh, the one called Fuyu is self pollinating. But it, it, uh, just F F U Y U. And if you don't throw gaki on there, you can. But anything that starts with the F-U-Y-U, the, uh, is a, it's a great, great ornamental. You're, and it's not a big tree. It's a small, uh, rounded tree. Oh, cool. Now, w- one more quick question while I got you. Uh, do you recommend any particular cover crop um, for the winter? For, like, vegetable gardens? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, you could grow ryegrass, which is easy. But one of my favorites is clover. There's this stuff called crimson clover. The seeds are real cheap, and the reason I like it because they're pretty. They make big, bushy plants, uh, and their roots, it, it, they, they absorb nitrogen from the air and store it in the little nodules on the roots. So in the spring, just when it begins to bloom, you can cut it down, let it sort of dry out, and till it under, and the tops provide a lot of good uh, uh, stuff, but also the roots have broken up your dirt and kept it nice and loose and provide nitrogen. So crimson clover or white clover, any of the clovers would be a good one. All righty, thank you so much. I feel, I feel real horticulture, Roy. Thank you for starting me out on a positive note here. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the information. All right, you bye-bye. Bet. You bet. Oh, boy, that was some stuff. I didn't, you know, what I've learned over the past 40 years as a horticulturist, retired extension horticulturist, and as a gardener, and also work with folks like y'all, I've learned what works well and what just does not work at all. And um, as a gardener, I must try to stick with both of them. Hey, let's go down to Hazelhurst and talk with Larry. Morning, sir. Well, I called you uh, 10 years ago. Uh, no, I did not. I heard you, though, say that uh, moving into a new house, and you said that uh, these knockout roses would grow in a cemetery. That's what I wanted, something I didn't have to care for. <laughs> yeah. And I planted uh, four. Uh, I had a new workshop, and uh, well, this is five years ago then, and uh, put one under each window so nobody could crawl in the window. Yeah. And oh, they were, and we put one on the corner of the house. We had five, and oh, were they wonderful until last year, one of them started turning brown, and I tried to prune back the brown leaves and left some other. Well, they had died. Yeah. Well, all three of the others are now turning brown. Yeah, are the leaves sticking on it and turning brown? Are they sticking, uh, they turning brown and sticking on? Uh, yeah, they're. Yeah, that's that dead. That's wow. dead. Yeah, you know, if a, if a plant, a plant can can leaves can turn colors and fall off and it's under stress, but if they turn brown and stick, that means that part of the plant is dead. And if all of them are doing it, a couple of things. One is knockout roses, like most roses that are grafted, don't live very long. You know, not like those old cemetery roses that are just stuck in the ground and growing their own roots. But grafted roses, um, you know, they, they, it's, 
it's too wet part of the year, it's too dry part of the year, back and forth, and you know our dirt, and they just get worn out. And so, uh, roses are really not that long term. Most of the store bought type, uh, unless you go with some of these antique or or heirloom type roses, most of them need to be either pruned really, really hard every few years or replaced every few years. It's just sort of the nature of the beast. Let me ask you this. Is there any place I could buy those cemetery roses? Uh, yeah, there's several places online. Uh, there's there's a couple of places that have plant sales uh, every year around the Jackson area that have them. Uh, but, you know, there's there's a place online called the Antique Rose Emporium. Uh, I, you know, I normally don't recommend, you know, we're not sponsored by them, but I know the folks real well. They've, they spent a lifetime collecting cuttings from old roses, old homestite, uh, uh, cemetery, roadside, and, uh, and propagating them on their own roots and not grafting. And that's one of the reasons why I like them. They're good folks. They have good roses. And it's called the Antique Rose Emporium. If you Google it, you'll, it it'll give you two. Go to their, their lists because there's too many roses to look at. You know, if you want a shrub, medium shrub, go to their medium shrub list. But uh, that's Thanks. a good place. And also, if you shoot me an email, I've got a, a list of the ones that, that grow in the old Greenwood Cemetery downtown Jackson that have been blooming for decades with no care at all. Good one. Good rose. I got a list of a handful of really good Aaron roses to start with. Well, thank you so much. Antique Rose Emporium online. I can get it. Yeah. Right. Nothing to it, man. Appreciate it. Uh-huh. All righty, folks, it's toll-free, 1-877-MPB-RING. Uh, while I was getting ready to come in this morning, I wandered around the yard with a cup of coffee, and I plucked a vegetable that I like. I pl- plucked an heirloom plant that I've grown for a long time. I plucked a wildflower, and I plucked a, um, a plant that is so easy to grow, it's almost embarrassing. You get a package of seeds, you find some bare dirt, you throw the seeds on top of the dirt, and you walk away. And they attract butterflies. They're beautiful. They're great cut flowers. Kids can grow them. They're called zinnias. Old-fashioned, tall, state fair type, knee-high to waist-high zinnias. One of the most versatile plants out there, native to the Americas. Beautiful cut flower, lots of flowers, lots of stems, lots of butterflies. And you just throw it on top of the dirt and walk away. So anyway, and by the way, the Latin name for zinnia is zinnia. We'll be right back with more of the Gestalt Gardener here on MPB right after this. This is MPB Think Radio. Mississippi is our mission. All righty, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing. Another great little heirloom plant. I'm not going to really talk much about it, but I got an email this week about a lady who says she's got a green thumb and everything except petunias. Can't grow petunias like her grandmother did. What's the problem? And uh, it's because she's been growing the store-bought petunias. Petunias are, are are cool season plants. They grow all summer up north and in and in England and in Seattle. Uh, down here, they really almost prefer winter better. They don't like hot, humid weather. Uh, but they, so they're, this one called Purple Wave. This fragrant and it's a pretty good one, heat tolerant. But most of the petunias you get, they're going to peter out in the summertime. What her grandmother grew was an old reseeding type. Some people call them vine petunia because they're floppy. They have pastel, soft pink, soft lavenders, white, very soft pastel flowers, intensely fragrant, and they reseed themselves. Gardeners don't sell them because they're scraggly in a pot. But these old-fashioned reseeding, um, what some people call climbing petunias, heirloom petunias, they'll reseed themselves and come back for decades and smell good, too. Uh, anyway, it's a call-in program. We're going to yak with you about your yard, and we're going to start out with a fellow who he's on the road. Hey, Bob, thank you for calling. What's up, man? Thank you, Felder. It's nice to be on your show again. Thank you. Every uh, spring, I call you to talk about cutting back the banana trees uh-huh. in the courtyard in New Orleans. But mm-hmm. this time, I'm calling to get your advice on constructing and operating a greenhouse. Okay. Are you still in New Orleans? down there loves her plants and raises uh, monarch butterflies, and yeah. I want to help her do it better. Well, you know, the monarchs, they don't really need a greenhouse. They they just like flowers, you know, lots of different kind of flowers. You know, a greenhouse, in order to have a butterfly house, you need a really, really big one, um, you know, so they can fly and flutter and stuff like that. I, I actually helped design a 30,000 square foot butterfly house at the Jackson Zoo some years ago. Uh, so wow. anyway, uh, it, it, the monarchs really aren't meant to be kept over the winter in a greenhouse. They're wild creatures. But uh, so if she just plants a lot of different kind of 
flowers that monarchs like, and and I, I don't remember what the host plant for monarch is. I, I can look it up during the break, but whatever it is that monarchs prefer to lay their eggs on, what their caterpillars prefer to eat. Milkweed. In, milk, no, well, no, that's that's uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's the most common one, and uh, there is a milkweed that grows really well in New Orleans that can actually bloom all winter if we have a mild winter, uh, and it's called tropical milkweed. Now, you know, okay. it causes problems along the uh, along the Rio Grande, but when the monarchs migrate down to Mexico, a lot of times they stick there on the ones that are that are along the Rio Grande, and they don't go any further. But in uh, New Orleans, that's not a problem. But the plant that's called tropical milkweed, some people call it blood milkweed because the flowers are red and orange instead of uh, red and yellow instead of orange. It blooms all summer. It'll get chest high. It is easy to grow. It roots well. It's a pretty plant, and it's there all the time. And if you got that, wow. and monarchs can make it through the rooftops. I mean, if, if you're a monarch, you're flying about 3,000 feet up. New Orleans might not be the place you'd want to head. You'd want to go to the swamps around it where there's some native milkweeds. So anyway, okay. if she wants to grow them in, in a, to, to keep them, uh, year round and to to keep their caterpillars going and their eggs and all like that, the easiest milkweed to grow is the one called. It's got a Latin name. It's called Cura Savica, C U R R something. But uh, if you look up uh, tropical milkweed, and garden centers in New Orleans sell it, it it will bloom all year. Okay. Now, now to answer cool. to answer your question real quick, the greenhouse she can need to have it where it's only shut up in the winter time because a greenhouse. Uh, it's hot and, and humid enough in New Orleans without trapping it in like a like a right. car with the windows rolled up. So you only really need the greenhouse during cold weather. Otherwise, it gets right. too hot. So mostly, I would have uh, something with a glass roof on it with some nice green doors you can shut when it gets cold. Okay. Well, that's great advice. Yeah, tropical milkweed. It's a great plant. And if you go online and read something about it, some people don't plant it. It's terrible for, for modern. That's not true. That's based on a real limited area, mostly along the Rio Grande, where they concentrate. They don't go further south, and a disease-type thing builds up there. Not a problem in most of the country. Great. Builder, as always, you've been great. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, Bob. Thanks. For, oh, good to hear from you, man. You. All righty. By the way, that's something so, non-Southerners don't understand. He said, come see us. Java, come see us. Y'all come see us. We don't mean come knock on our door. It just means good to see you. See you later. <laughs> Let's go up to uh, Columbus, Mississippi. No, is it, no, Columbia, down in Columbia. Marcella, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fine, Felder. Good. I enjoy your show and learned a lot of, over the years. Thanks. Um I wanted to ask you about some alpine strawberries. I had planted some last year, and uh-huh. the, the strawberries that came on them, they were real small. Yeah, they're they real are. sweet. Yeah, they're small. Are they supposed to be small? Yeah, yeah. There's one of the reasons why you can't buy them in stores to speak of. They're too much labor to pick, find them and pick them, but they're intensely, for, and they smell good, too. Yes, they do. But okay, uh, No, uh, they're, 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 small, they're small fruits. Okay, can I transplant them some? When would be a good time to transplant? I want to put them in a bigger bed. Well, you know, they send runners out, you know, over the summertime, and the runners make new plants. And uh, what commercial growers, you know, do is they don't keep a strawberry patch going. What they do is they plant things in the fall or the spring or winter, and it has berries that year. And they send out runners, and the next year they dig up their original plants, let the runners be the new plants. And then the next year the runners stuff sends stuff back to where the original, so they move them back and forth. So any time in the fall or the winter or before they bloom in the spring is a good time to move them. You'll get okay. a few berries, a few flowers, a few berries, and then plant them so they have a little elbow room. And when the runners spread out next summer, then uh, the next fall, snip out a few of the old original plants so that you can keep them going back and forth and back and forth. Keep new plants coming on all the time. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about blackberries, uh, wild blackberries? Can I transplant? How, how can I transplant some of those? Well, you, 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 blackberries bloom in the spring on what's growing right now. So when you see those long canes right now, that's where the flowers and the berries could be next year. So uh, if you want to just find something productive, cut them back to a few inches tall, you know, maybe a foot, foot and a half tall of this year's growth. Just move the roots. Um, what grows off of those next year can have some berries. 
What 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 they do though uh, commercially is when they get through picking them in the summertime, they cut them back to about a foot, foot and a half or so tall, let them sprout out, spraying them for the next year. But uh, mainly, if you're going to move them, cut them back to a, a a few inches, a foot or so tall, and just move that, let them sprout out next year. So move the root now. Is it- I, I would move in the, right now. I mean, it's still you know it's still summertime. It's tough on plants right. to move. Or they need their roots, and when you dig a plant, you leave all the little feeder roots behind. No way to. To, to not do that, so it's really stressful to move things. You can do it, but it's a lot of trouble, and you're gonna get okay. red. You're gonna get it, red bugs, you know. Fall. Yeah, move it when. Yeah, cut it want, back a foot and move. Yeah, just move move the little roots, a little little clumpy okay. thing. Uh, might want to throw this out there. Are some named varieties, some cultivated varieties, that produce a whole lot bigger and sweeter, more dependable than the wild ones? I, I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. I had one uh, that was supposed to be thornless, and it didn't live hardly a year. Yeah, well, well, you know, so maybe I can get some wild one. It's possible. Somewhere. It's possible. You know, they're brambles. There's a reason why they're called brambles. So every year when you get through picking them, cut them back to a foot or so tall, middle of the summer, and that'll get rid of all the thorny old stuff and send out some real strong fresh runners for new berry, strong berries next yeah. year. So instead of cutting them in the wintertime like you do roses, cut blackberries right after you get through picking them in the summertime and let them sprout back out for next year. Okay, okay. Well, I appreciate it. And um, if you had time, uh, what about hydrangeas? Can they be transplanted in the fall? Yeah, yeah. Uh, tra- you know, if it's an old plant, you know, not going to do so well, you might want to try rooting well, some about cutting. about three or four years old, and they're getting so big in the area that I have them, I wanted to move them in a larger area. Yeah, listen, let, when, you, when you get ready to move them uh, after we get a frost or something, go ahead and cut them back, you know, to, you know like you would a rose, pretty hard. And then move them, and then that balances the top with the roots. And next year, they'll sprout out. Might even bloom next year if you don't cut them too hard. But main thing is prune it before you move it. That's a okay. that's just a mantra with, with plants. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you for your information. Thank you. You bet. Appreciate Bye. it. Appreciate it. Uh, the wildflower I'm talking about, it's not really a wildflower. You know Black-Eyed Susan. Everybody see Black-Eyed Susan on the roadside there. You know, I got this little thumb, the brown, uh, dark brown cone in the middle. It's got the uh, yellow, orangey, golden type of, of ray flowers. Uh, Black-Eyed Susan are real, real common, but the most common ones seed themselves. They grow over the winter. They bloom in the spring. They set seed, and they die. So they're more of a late winter, spring, early summer thing. There is a perennial Black-Eyed Susan. Um that grows like a, like a little clump of leaves, and it spreads and spreads and spreads, not fast, but it spreads, and it blooms all summer long. Mine are still in full bloom. Um, Latin name for black-eyed Susan is Rudbeckia. Rudbeckia. Uh, see, if you look up black-eyed Susan, it leads you to Rudbeckia. Well, then Google perennial Rudbeckia. Uh, it's got a couple of different names. Goldsturm is one of them, but the perennial black-eyed Susans are great plants for folks who want to grow wildflowers in town without their neighbors thinking they're trashy people. You know, purple cone flowers, black eyed susan, pink flocks. These are garden quality native plants that are great for native wildlife. So anyway, Rudbeckia, black eyed susan, the perennial one blooms all summer and hot, dry weather, you bet. Uh, hey, let's go to um, mm, Anderson. Anna's, Anna's calling from Madison. Hey, Anna, good morning. Morning. Howdy, what's up? I had some potatoes brought me in my compost heap, and it got me excited about those potatoes. But when I bought some from Walmart, the little seed potatoes, they really didn't do much. And I was wondering if you could recommend uh, where to get potatoes to uh, try again in the fall or next spring or something yeah. like that. And you're talking about Irish potatoes, right? Uh, yeah, I kind of prefer the... Yeah, 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 as opposed yeah. to sweet potatoes. Uh, yeah. here, here's the thing. Potatoes, you know, when you go to, uh, to Idaho, where potatoes grow, or England or Ireland, where potatoes are a staple crop, they grow over the summertime up there. Here, they don't like hot, hot, hot weather. So typically, we plant uh, potatoes in late February or March. They grow and takes about a three and a half, maybe four months before they start to flower, and that's when you dig them. So we dig them really before middle of the summer and because they, they suffer. They get diseases, and, and they rot here. So uh, you typically plant them in late February or March, harvest them, and it's almost impossible to get to, to get fresh sweet, fresh seed potatoes to plant for fall harvest. And the ones in stores a lot of times are not the varieties that do well in home gardens anyway. They're commercial varieties. So uh, most of the garden centers locally, you're in Madison. There's a place called Hutto's down in Jackson. They sell two or three different kinds of, of Irish potato for, for seed pieces. And again, you, you plant them late February or March. That's the best time. 
Okay. Well, would hutters have any to try for the fall? No, no, nobody, no. I mean, they just don't. They don't grow well here. They're 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 cool. They're they're cool climate plants, and we have a torrid, hot climate with a little cool spell in the spring. But it's hard to get any. Nobody's. It's possible if you could find somebody selling what they call new potatoes that have been dug this year, and like a farmer's market, they may sprout and grow. But it's going to be it's going to be a gamble that they'll produce before it freezes and, and kills the plants back. So anyway, if you want to give them a try, go to a farmer's market and look for what they call some new potatoes that have been dug locally. Um, you know, th- this time okay. of year, and uh, otherwise, do most of your potato planting in in uh, February March. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, and I did have another question about my basil. My basil has little flower heads. Yeah. When can I try to? Uh, harvest those for seeds. I just have it. I wanted to try. Oh uh, well, I mean, you know, they it it's hard to say because you know those flowers are really really small and they're edible. By the way, the flowers are perfectly edible. Um, oh. And you know, sometime in in the the late summer fall, a lot of those seeds, uh, those flowers will will drop these little dry looking brown seed pods. Got to really look for them. Take a piece of paper and envelope and bend the 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 top over carefully and thump it to see if you can knock some seeds out onto a piece of paper. Oh. But uh, you know, after flower phase, if it get and it's going to get pollinated because they are bee and hummingbird magnets. Um, but anyway, wait wait till some of the flower, till one of the flower stems has got some old dead flowers and some that are even older than that, and some fresh flowers, and just thump it on a piece of paper and see what kind of seeds you can find. They also root really well in water. You can carry them over the winter time in in a windowsill in a mason jar. Oh, okay, that's supposed to be fun. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Appreciate your call. Whew. We're on a roll this morning. More calls or cheesy music? I'll leave it up to you, Felder. What you want to do? Well, I want to, I want to talk. Of course I want to talk. But I want to ask you a question first. You said your grandmother had a question about something in her no, yard. No. Uh, well, my mother, your she mother. was talking about these new mushrooms that have popped up in the, in the yard. Yeah. So, are, are, are they white and in a circle? Are they just odd? Well, you don't know. She was asking. No, well, I saw them this morning when I took the kids over there, and they're white, little small ones, a couple yeah. couple big ones, but they just kind of spread out, just yeah. little white, you know, mushrooms. Yeah, and, and they're, they're not edible, by the way. There may be some you can eat, but there's some that shut your liver down real quick. Well, mushrooms are the happy of a fungus. They're the fungus version of a flower. Uh, a fungus looks like little thread-looking stuff, and it eats decaying organic matter. Uh, roots, dead roots, tree roots, dead stuff, uh, grass clippings, thatch, you know, anything that's decay. Uh, bacteria and fungi are what sort of clean stuff up out in the yard. And when that little thread-looking mycelia mat is happy, the weather's right, the temperatures are moisture, they're going to say, woo and they can send up their version of a flower, and that's a mushroom or a toadstool or a puffball. Or, so this sort of like flower. And, and I, I mentioned it's sort of like the, the guys who, who, uh, who come around and, and, and collect the, the, the trash collectors and the big old smile. That's what a mushroom is. They're 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 hard, Gar- garbage man with a smile on his they're face. They're hardworking. They're doing good stuff. They're helping us out. And every now and then, one's going to smile at you real big. Celebrate it. Just don't eat them. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, we got a couple of calls along, but let's let's cut to. I got a kind of a short tune this morning, and I want to play it because this this year's this guy is ninety years old this year, born in nineteen thirty five, and still kicking. One of the earliest, hardest rockers ever from up in North Axis, from right across the river from uh, Faraday, Louisiana. But got his real start kicking around some nightclubs and in uh, Natchez, but he is worldwide. His tunes changed the world. He's kicking, 90 years old. And I found a song of him where he sounded like he might have been a little drunk singing a song, but it made me feel good. I'm Horticulture's Felder Rushing. Me and Java Chapman, uh, the other pro- one of the other producers here, Kevin Farrell, is our phone greeter today. We're going to take just a little minute and a half or so break and come back with some phone calls talking about gardening here in the Magnolia State. Magnolia State, remind me to talk about that when we come back. Horticulture's Felder Rushing, we'll be right back. Yeah, 
flying high Over that old rainbow I wonder why, Lord, can't I Someday I'll reach the point of star Wake up with the clouds all behind me Where kisses are melting like lemon drops Way above the chimney tops That's where you'll find me Somewhere over the rainbow Bluebirds fly They're flying high over the rainbow Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. All righty, folks, welcome back. Old Jerry Lee Lewis singing Silver on the Rainbow at nine years old. Um, before I take this next call, let me mention this. This is the last round. They've, they've narrowed down the, the selection for the Mississippi state flag to two. One is a shield that, I'll be honest with you, is a pretty flag. It looks nice, but it's on every NFL football helmet. It's on uh, insurance commercials. It's oil commercials. It's such a generic, generic thing. But one of the selections has a magnolia on it. Not, not my favorite flag, but it's got a magnolia flower on it. You can vote on it. This is Mississippi Department of Archives and History, MDAH. Just Google MDAH. And it'll take you to the website, a little thing at the bottom, click on it, and you can vote. Right now they're running neck and neck. The Magnolia's got like 50. 51% of the vote. The Shield has got 49%. But anyway, you can vote on it, and the commissioners are going to decide between the two next week, and they do look at these polls. Yeah, just to give the proper address is mdah.ms.gov. <laughs> so mdah.ms. Dot G-O-V. Yeah, but I found if you just do M-D-A-H for Mississippi Department of Archives, it'll take you to it. See, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of the old guys. I don't have as many fingers as you young people do. But anyway, vote on it. My prefer- preference is anything with the Magnolia because we are the Magnolia State. We're not the insurance company logo state. That's just my opinion. But uh, anyway, uh, William's been hanging on from Star Wars for a long time. William, thank you so much, man. What's going on? Am I on the air? Yes, you are. Finally, I, I got heard. through. I got through yakking. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I didn't hear the normal break to invite me on, but anyway, I heard you talk of crimson clover. I've got two questions, by the way. But the first one, I heard you speak of crimson clover and wondered uh, when is the right time to to put the seed out. Yeah, uh, clovers, you know, they grow over the wintertime. I would say late September, October. You know, you can put them out as late as November, but they'll get a head start if you put them out sometime a month or six weeks or so from now when it starts cooling down a little bit and they'll come. I mean, you can put them out right now. They're not going to sprout till fall. But the seeds have got to be touching real dirt, not caught up in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So uh, late, late September, October, 1st of November. That's the first question. Here's the important one. My wife has some some old buttermilk uh, in the fridge that she wants to dispose of, and I just wondered, can I use it as fertilizer on some uh, walnut seedlings I'm growing or some other? Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. That's, I don't think I can stand a smell of rotten buttermilk. I mean, buttermilk smells rotten to begin with to me. That's just my, you know, uh, but oh, I, I, anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it would hurt to just use as water, but it's, I don't think there's any real fertilizer value to it. I'll be darned. Uh, and I, I suppose you 
probably have the same opinion with uh, using it in a compost heap. I, I don't no, no, that you know that'd be a great place because it's going to have it's going to have some stuff in it. You know, may, uh, maybe a little vitamin D or something like that. It'll have some stuff that the that the bacteria and fungi will like. It'll it'll help them. But uh, natural things like have got to be broken down in the soil by microorganisms before they're available as a nutrient to plants. And yep. putting it right on potting soil, it's going to take a while to break down. It's going to stink. But throw it in a compost. That'd be a, That'd be a great thing. Matter of fact, put it on half of it, and uh, and and see if you can tell a difference. But put it on the half furthest away from the kitchen door. Thank you so much. That that (laughs) questions well. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it, William. Thank you. I know. Okay, now let's go to uh, looks like uh, Florence, Alabama. Is that right, Josh? Yep, that's correct. Man, you you are up there in the nosebleed part. Look, I, I pick up the service on partly cloudy days or the station on partly <laughs> cloudy days. And so if it's ever raining or super sunny, I don't get my MPB for the, the morning. Well, so. let's, let's, it, you might have some clouds hitting your way, so let's make it quick. What's going on? So I, I bought a property that has some oak leaf hydrangeas. Oh, yeah. Na- um, native, and, native ones or were they planted? Probably planted because they're in front of the house. Okay, yeah. And so um, I know that you're only supposed to – you have to cut them at a certain time, or and if you don't cut them, they won't have new growth back for the next year. They get the new growth in there. So when is the best time for me to trim those back? Uh, oak, oak leaf hydrangeas, which, by the way, they just hang over all the creeks and riversides up in northwest Alabama. You can take a canoe ride in the in uh, in uh, May and June, and they're just dripping off the hillsides there. Um, they bloom on what? grows this year as long as it sprouts off of something that grew last year so what i'm saying is what you've got right now if you cut it back beyond follow the ends of the branch back to where it started this past spring as long as you leave some of that what sprouts off of what's left will bloom next year so sometime in the winter time or right after they bloom cut them back so that you leave some of this year's growth so, okay. I mean, you can cut so them back to the, in the winter time. I'm good. Yeah, cut, cut them in the winter time, but follow the branch from the tip back to where it started the previous spring and leave about half of that. Okay, perfect. And, and then last question is we have a new backyard, meaning that we spent a lot of money during COVID mm-hmm. to redo that because we spent a lot of time. My wife has tried to grow lavender twice yeah. and failed miserably. Yeah. And so we're trying to grow something in pot. That smells good and may keep the mosquitoes away. Do you have a recommendation for that? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, on the last thing, there's nothing you can put out there that's going to keep mosquitoes away. The only way those kind of plants work is if you rub them on your, you get the oil on your body. There's no Got plants it. that repel. That's just a, an unbelievably popular myth. So, uh, it is. Is it any anything that has fragrant uh, leaves that you can brush through big pots, you know, where you brush through it, uh, uh, rosemary, um, uh, oregano, basil, any of those kind of things will work pretty well about uh, you know keeping mosquitoes off of where they brush. Uh, let gotcha. me throw this, and, and there's some really good ones. Basil is there's several different kinds of basil, including one with pretty burgundy leaves. They're really really easy to grow. Um, uh, rosemary grows well in a pot, makes a nice little bush. There's a cascading type. They're pretty and they're fragrant. Um, but let me throw this out about lavender. There is a lavender that will bloom in the south. And I heard about it. I wasn't sure about it. I didn't believe it. I researched it. I called old friends. And uh, I tried it. I got three plants and spread around last year. And it actually does well. And it's a type that's called, oh, phooey. I just draw, 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 oh, phenomenal. It's a variety called Phenomenal. Got it. Now, it has to be in a raised bed or a pot. If you put it in dirt, its roots are going to rot. Lavender does not like hot, humid summer nights, and if you water it, it dies. But if you put it in a big pot, it casc- mine is cascading over the side. It's beginning to bloom. But it's a little pricey, so shop around and make sure you get you know, a good price. Don't first one you see, don't get it. But the one called Phenomenal has done well. And uh, it's done well down in North Florida, too. Awesome. Yeah. I will do some digging and see if I can't find that. Yeah, well, i got to ask you a question. Have you ever been to, yes. the, been to the Coon Dog Cemetery? 
Oh, yes. I've been to the <laughs> Coon Dog Cemetery many times. You know, this is one of those things where, you know, you you don't know if you're in Alabama or Tennessee Louis, or, or Mississippi because it is out there. <laughs> yeah, I actually met the son of the original artist who carved uh, that big the tree with the coon on the t- raccoon on the top yep. and the dogs at the base of it. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> ain't, it a, so. ain't it a great world? Absolutely. Next time you're up here, make sure you check out Tom's Wall as well. It's right on the Natchez Trace Parkway, and it's the number one stop on the Natchez Trace Parkway. Okay, I'll do that. Tom's Wall. You got it. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Good luck on the yes, lavender. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. A coon Dog Cemetery. Got to be a registered coon dog with a you know with papers and everything to be buried at this place. And it's got a big uh, in the middle of it's got a a carved granite tree with a raccoon on top and some dogs at the base of it. And if you want to find out how I find out about this kind of stuff, go to a website called Roadside America. RoadsideAmerica.com. You can click on any state, and it has these little dots, red dots with numbers. Uh, scattered all over that state. You click on those, and it'll show you the most unusual, oddball, weird, oddity, interesting roadside attractions you could possibly imagine. Roadside America. And when I'm going anywhere, first thing I do is I click on Roadside America, see if there's some little side trip I can take that uh, where I end up place like the Coon Dog Cemetery. Let's go to uh, to pedal. Talk with Bobby. Oh, what? Is that Jerry in Germantown? Hey, Jerry. Good morning. Hey, fella, nice to talk to you again. Um, Howdy. I bought a place that uh, my back deck sits on a pond, and across the pond I got a hill that goes up, and I got about a half to three-quarters of an acre up there that's cleared out, and I bush hogged it a couple times and knocked all the stinking baby gum trees back. <laughs> yeah. my, I tell you. You mean, uh, you, mean my, you knocked them back temporarily? Well, yeah. Well, what I would like to do is ask you if there's a particular technique that little patch of ground that I could put wildflowers on and perhaps they would overcome the grass and the gum trees and all that. I mean, do I need to hit it with a glyphosate or do I need to do something else or just is there a particular type of flower that might just grow up there and, and do well? So yeah. I just I want to pick your brain. Yeah. It, it, and by the way, this is something I've worked with for a long time. I actually wrote the Extension Service publication on wildflowers from Mississippi Meadows and Lawns. And if you go to... Uh, to the, to the Mississippi State website is MSU Cares, Co- Coordinated Access Research and Experience, whatever, MSU Cares. And in the search box, just do Wildflower Meadows. It'll take you to several things, including the little publication I did. reason I'm saying this is because a lot of the online stuff is unnecessarily complicated or downright wrong for us. Here's a, in a nutshell, wildflowers that we that we like are going to be the spring and early summer bloomers or the fall perennials. And the spring and summer bloomers are the ones you put out by seed in the fall. Crimson clover, Queen Anne's lace, black-eyed Susan, coreopsis. These kind of things that bloom in the spring and early summer set seed and die, and then their seeds sprout again the next fall. So if you're going to plant some wildflowers, you need to get some bare dirt out there. Just take a, you know, right, as long as you can throw the seeds onto some bare dirt instead of caught up in grass and stuff. Well, and do this. Take a harrow to it. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd, that'd be fine. You know, without doing it such a good job, j- just do a few sections here and there so you don't start some erosion. In other words, don't do not do the whole thing. Do strips here, here and there. And uh, throw the seeds out in late September, October. Uh, I would not go with a wildflower mix because they've got things that will sprout here but not there or there but not here. You know, uh, see me, shoot me an email and I'll give you a list of three or four or five really easy ones. And that, that include crimson clover, by the way, which will improve your soil. Anyway, these things, you plant the seeds in the fall, they bloom, they set seed, they die the next summer. And then we have the fall perennials, goldenrods, ironweed, um, you know, these kind of things that bloom in the fall from plants that survive over the, over the, the, the summertime. Bottom line is you can still have to bush hog at least once a year, middle of the That's summer. Okay. 
Yeah. It because, sounds like what you're telling me, the plant would also be very good for uh, pollinators and bees and stuff. Oh, yeah, they're the best. I mean, that's what that's what the, you know, the honeybees are, you know, they're not from North America, but they'll pollinate just about anything. But we have a lot of really good native pollinators. As a matter of fact, around the edges of your area, if you leave some brush piles, just push some stuff up, you know, some logs and limbs and stuff like that, that's where our native pollinators and our, our uh, that, that's where they live. They need brush piles. So anyway, think about planting seeds on dirt just here and there in the fall, bush hogging in the summer to spread the seeds and to keep the sweet gums down, and that'll make the fall blooming stuff. It'll nip it back and make it bushier instead of tall and floppy. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, cut it short as I can and take my walk behind Tiller over and till some up and drag a hair across. Yeah, just, just do some. You don't even have to drag a hair. Yeah, what, whatever. The main thing is just some, some dirt. And again, Coreopsis, Black Eyed Susan, Queen Anne's Lace, Crimson Clover. Those are good ones to start with. Can't, go, can't, can't go wrong with those. What's your email? Uh, garden at mpbonline.org. All right. Well, thank you. It's great to listen to you. All right. Appreciate it, man. Good luck on it. Bye-bye. Oh, boy. The, now, Bobby. Now, Bobby. How are you, sir? From All Pe- right. From Pedal. What's up, man? Uh, about a water oak. I know down across the coast, you know, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, there's a lot of these old live oaks that right. go a long limb down to the ground, and another tree will come up from the end of that limb. Right. I've got a water oak that's doing that. It's got a great big limb going out in the field. It goes down to the ground. It's done it for years and years and years. We're waiting on a new tree to grow. Will it happen with a water oak, or am I just wasting my time? Yes. Well, first of all, it's interesting looking. You know, so you're not wasting time. It's 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 unique well, yeah, and no, it's no, fun. No. Yeah, it's unique and it's fun. Uh, they usually don't root though. Here here's the deal. Oaks don't have. You know, you you don't see many people growing oaks from cuttings or magnolias from cuttings because they don't form roots on twigs like a lot of shrubs do. You know, they, they just don't, they, they don't have what's called preformed root initials. So they don't root as well. Uh, but if it grows down the ground and stays there long enough, it can develop some roots. That's just not, it's, it's not normal, it's not natural, and it sure ain't quick. But it is possible. It's possible. It's possible. Meanwhile, ain't it a fun thing to have out in the yard? Well, What's kind of odd, you watch it green up in the summer, and it goes all the way to the ground, lays tight, looks real pretty, bushes out around it. And then in the winter, when the leaves fall off and just light, it pops up about four inches. <laughs> so huh. it's done that every year, but I'm not putting oh, any oh, oh, the, the, nature take its course. Oh, the limb keeps coming out of the ground. Yeah, it'll lay on the ground as long as it's loaded down with leaves. And then when the leaves fall off, you go out there and it's about four inches off the ground yeah. all went along. Then the next summer, it's back down tight to the ground again. Uh, I guess I could throw some dirt on it, but I don't no, know. No, 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 it, no. No, anybody can grow, you know, you can grow an oak tree from from anything. Let's enjoy this thing for what it's worth. It's a, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's like a, a little play going on out there. It's, it's a fun thing. Let's enjoy it for what it is. It is. It's pretty. One more thing. Yeah. Uh, Check your mouth on Larry. Check your mouth on Jerry Lee's age there. He was born in 1935. That'd make him 85 years old this year. 35? No, th- this is this is 2000. Oh, you're Heads right. Up. You're you're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. Okay. Hey, so he got Thanks another five years before we can still talk about kicking at ninety. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I appreciate. Bye. You know, this reason I went into horticulture because it didn't require a lot of math. <laughs> I appreciate it. See you later. <laughs> well, Java, people are listening. They're listening and paying attention. <laughs> now, let's go slide back to Jackson and talk with Gene. Good morning, Gene. How are you? Hey, good morning. Howdy. What's up? Oh, just fine. I, I just want to say something to those that will be voting on the flag mm-hmm. uh, to remind them that if they look at the flag of the Virgin Island, mm-hmm. it has that shield. Yeah. Uh, it has the shield already. So I would ask that they would vote for the Magnolia flower. Uh, I, I agree, partly because of the Magnolia state, but that shield yes. is on everything. I've seen people, uh, an unbelievable number of things have got that shield. It's real, it just doesn't seem, it's, it's got a little squiggly line that represents the river. Oh, well. So anyway, I would encourage them. But the, the, the commission is going to vote what they're going to vote on. But they do look at this poll. Well, your math, your math is right. On, on, on the people that voted for the Magnolia out of the five flags, four of them, the four 
that was there with Magnolia on it uh, outnumber the number of people that voted for the shield. Yeah. So I would have to. I, 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 I do. Them. I do hope we go with something that says Mississippi, not something just a generic shield. That so you got to explain to somebody. But anyway, I appreciate that, man. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, now let's talk to Cedric. He's on the road. What's up, Cedric? Hey, how you doing? We're fine. We're starting to run out of time, but what what can I help you with real quick? Okay, I planted two uh, Methley plum trees mm-hmm. last year, and uh, one of them is, is pretty full. Yeah, and the other one is just growing straight up. Cut it back. You know, it, it, cut it. Cut it back. Cut it back. Do, do, how, how tall is it now? Seven, eight feet tall. Yeah. Uh huh. In in uh, January, February, cut it back to about thigh high. Just cut it back. It'll sprout back out and be more like a tree you can pick on down the road. But otherwise, it's going to grow straight up into a tree. But cut it back to make it bush out next year. Okay. Okay. So cut it back to about five foot? No, no, no. Three or four feet. Three or four feet. Okay. All, All right. right. I'll do it. All righty, All man. Right. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Cedric. All right. Thanks a lot. I didn't get around to the vegetable of the day, but this year I brought in my first ever, my burgundy okra. Okra is in the hibiscus family. Beautiful burgundy leaves, beautiful yellow hibiscus family, uh, hibiscus flowers, and long burgundy pods. I'm going to take this thing and slice it up and bread it and fry it, put me some ketchup on it. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So anyway, we're talking about a lot of stuff today, folks. Some of it was horticulture, some of it was gardening, some philosophical, some was about my back. Bad math, Coon Dog Cemetery. That's what we do. It's a party, folks. And uh, we appreciate you joining. Me and Java Chapman, uh, Kevin Farrell, the uh, producer who's our phone greeter today. Horticulture's fell to rushing here at MPB. We like to call it Think Radio. Um, saw some things starting to bloom for fall and getting excited about it. Got my beets and carrots up already. Going to plant some uh, cabbage and broccoli next week. Going to mow my grass high and enjoy the mushrooms out there, folks. Anyway, if you get a chance, take a kid to a farmer's market. Take a kid to a a walk in the woods. Show them how to do what we do best, and that's 